The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com, where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? And this week on Where Did The Road Go? I have a, a special treat for both me and you. In studio here, we have Peter Robbins. Hello, Peter. Hi, Soraya. And uh, just so happens you live fairly local to us. Go figure. And that is absolutely awesome. <laughs> it's a novelty being in the studio. I'm sure. You said you've done hundreds of interviews at this point. An awful lot, yeah. And usually uh, by landline now, of course, uh, by Skype and occasionally by cell. But we're in the studio. We're not making believe. <laughs> Which means we're not going to get disconnected. And <laughs> there's not going to be an echo or anything else weird, I, I hope. Because if there is, there's something really weird going on. Well, with the nature of this show, you never know. True. And you are known, well, you are known in particular for your book, Left at East at Westgate? Left at Eastgate. Eastgate. Which, I had it right uh, the first time. You did, uh, which I co-wrote with a great guy named Larry Warren uh, about uh, what's now regarded as England's best known and uh, best documented UFO incident. I, I would almost say it's probably one of the best examples of a, a documented UFO incident. I think so. We spent nine years working the case, and Larry was an eyewitness as a United States Air Force security police officer, so uh, it was personal. Hmm. The, um, like, like when you look at Roswell, I mean, there's a lot of stuff thrown back and forth at Roswell, but as far as hard evidence goes, there's not enough to really pin anything down one way or another. And I think unless, unless the government actually came out and said, yes, we have a crashed saucer and here it is, that is the only resolution we would ever get to Roswell, whether something happened or not. Because if nothing happens, you can't prove a negative, and well, we will never get, you know. There, there is a, a lot of evidence, but not like a spark plug from a right, flying saucer. Right. Uh, for three years, one of the coolest jobs I ever had was I worked as a consultant and advisor out of the mayor's office to the city of Roswell. Hmm. Um, part of it was to help the city build what I would term responsible UFO-related tourism, split between educational and entertaining. And every summer to mark the uh, anniversary of the crash, they have a huge series of events. Um, it's been cut back a bit the last few years. Uh, but especially over those years, I got to spend time with some of the best research specialists in that area of ufology and um, some of the evidence that I saw was very compelling mm. um, again things come forward artifacts come forward something allegedly out of the debris field that when analyzed uh, represents a highly refined uh, form of say aluminum or another metal but it's not like we're going to find a new metal yeah. or a new material it's all pretty much out there that we have here yeah and I, i've always i've always been on the fence about roswell honestly because i always liked john keel's explanation of it being a, a fugo balloon i believe it was well i'm um, also uh, um nick redfern um is quite outspoken on that in fact um one year i hired him to speak there because he had worked up um, a very interesting presentation on an alternate theory that uh, using a V2, and it was it was somewhat creepy um, with a human being with progeria, uh, that disease that ages you very quickly but results in a very large cranium, mm -hmm. combined with this thing and that thing and that thing. Um, he made a good case, but for me not quite good enough. I, I do feel that something or two things uh, anomalous did go down on the... Uh, sands outside of Roswell that summer. Hmm. Uh, but whether we'll know for sure, I, I doubt. <laughs> well, that's it. And like I said, unless they came out and admitted it and showed us the flying saucer, that's the only way we would know 100% for sure. And they seem to be doing just the opposite as often as possible. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you, and you got to wonder if the people running it now even know the truth. 
from back then? <laughs> well, the very last of that generation are disappearing right yeah. now. Um, two of my favorite Roswell scholars, Don Schmidt and Tom Carey, have written a number of books on it. And one of the most compelling is called Witness to Roswell. And for it, they interviewed dozens and dozens of individuals who were alive then, even some of them as kids. And one of the things, nobody was paid, nobody wanted to be on a talk show, nobody seemed to be doing it for some ego-driven reason. And one of the things that kept coming up was if the parent might have been in a position to uh, know something privileged or handle debris, these children, nobody compared notes, these were independent interviews, etc., uh, the threats on their lives by the military police mm. who visited everybody at their homes uh, were maddening. Um, just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we lost Jesse Marcel Jr., um, who was one of the most ethical and decent guys I've ever met. Um, Jesse's dad was uh, Major Jesse Marcel Sr., the intelligence officer at the old Roswell Army Airfield, and he was one of the first two American military personnel out at the debris site. It was the ranch foreman, Mac Brazel, um, who first came upon the debris site. Right. And this is the stuff of myth, legend and myth, but he came home that night, Jesse Sr., um, with a box filled with crash debris. And Jesse Jr. Um, has always maintained and never backed down from his memory of being awakened that night by his dad and told to come down to the kitchen and there was the box mm -hmm. and going through these things. And the piece that intrigued him the most was like a little miniature eye beam. It was light as balsa wood. Uh, you couldn't scratch it. The, um, it had a certain series of markings on it, call it what you will. And he asked his dad if he could keep it, and he said, yeah. But within 48 hours, uh, Army Air Corps MPs showed up at the house and uh, asked him if his dad had given him anything, and if mm -hmm. he did, to give it back, and he did. Um, this is a guy who went on to a career as a distinguished military officer himself and finished his uh, service with the Air Force as a flight surgeon on the ground in Iraq at the age of 70. Um, hmm. not that long ago. And uh, we mourn his passing. He's a very decent guy. And we last were together in May at a series of hearings at the National Press Club in Washington where a colleague of ours had, because um, Congress does not have the courage to address this subject, may never again unless, you know, the proverbial one lands on the White House lawn. I don't, I don't think they have the courage to address much. They really. don't. They're really a bunch of weasel boys and girls. <laughs> um, but we, what, what we did was the closest thing we could to um, a sense of a congressional investigation. And for five days, five retired congressional representatives and one retired senator um, put us basically um, through the process of uh, swearing to tell the truth. And then 40, oh, more than 40 of us um, gave testimony on our either our research specialties, but the ones who really captivated our attention were the military pilots um, and former government officials who were brought in from around the world. It was a major event. Um, simultaneous translation to four languages with a live stream. Um, it was just one after another after another. Not there. Nobody was there for, you know, glory or money as much as they have been through these things. A number of pilots um, from Central America mm. uh, described the experiences they had had uh, being scrambled and being ordered to chase unknowns and getting them in their sights and then ordered to fire. And in every case, and this is part of the history of military encounters with UFOs that we're aware of, at least the credible backed up ones, that their electrics just go out or they're unable to discharge their weaponry. Hmm. And um, But anyway, we'll miss Jesse. And uh, I think he added great credibility to the Roswell story. Well, I think when you, when you deal with the subject of UFOs, it's if you actually look at it, 
honestly, unbiasedly, you will have to come to the conclusion that there is something going on. Bingo. You may not have to say what it is, but there is something going on. Everyone is not making it up. Correct. Sure, there's there's the occasional hoaxer. There's the there's, very occasional, but sure they're out there. And there's the plenty of misidentifications of lights in the Most of them are stuff. misidentifications. Yeah, but there's a few that are simply undeniably unknowns. We don't know what no. they are. In the old Project Blue Book, um, although they didn't promote this, the stats of the true unknown ones came in at well over 20%. And to paraphrase my colleague Stanton Friedman, uh, distinguished nuclear physicist who's been involved in this for more than 40 years, this is not a direct quote, but um, the question is not, are UFOs um, highly technologically advanced machines of unknown origin that come and go with impunity from parts unknown? The question is, has one ever been? And of course, more than one has been, and repeatedly. The, uh, well, there's also the theory that they could be conscious. Yeah, whatever they are. And there may be, uh, I've, over the years that I've been doing this work, and I approached it originally when I got into it, is um, what is regarded as now one of the most conservative and conventional attitudes that they're from other planets, you know, other solar systems, mm -hmm. what have you. And I'm reasonably convinced that certainly some are but the others are wild card. Um, a dimension right next to us, what have you. I think the colleagues that I find myself in most conflict with are the ones who will tell you exactly what is going on, who they are, where they come from, how long they've been coming, what they have for lunch, why they're here. <laughs> this is for me um, borderline insulting. <clears throat> Anybody's entitled to their own opinion. Sure. But when you pass it, you try to pass it off as empirical fact instead of this is what I believe, I suspect, I think, I fear, I theorize. And I'm very careful about vetting those things for my own work. And, and that, I think, is what hurts the UFO phenomenon. Oh, yeah. Because those are always the people that the media latches on to. Yep. Oh, they're from Zeta Reticuli, yeah. and then they laugh about it because they're stating this as a fact, and they have nothing to back it up, and then they just look like kooks. One of my um, favorite pet peccadillos in this area is people who will give you specific numbers. Mm -hmm. um, in the current issue of a great new um, UFO magazine that your listeners should know about, it's called UFO Truth. Its second issue is out there. It comes out of the UK. It's uh, an online zine. But uh, the first two issues have been close to 100 pages, brilliant production values, mm. and I'm proud to be a regular columnist for them. Um, a colleague, a very well-known person in the work, Dr. Stephen Greer, who I have a number of issues with, but who has done some good work. But he drives me crazy. And I write about it in the current issue. Um, it was relative to a statement he made not that long ago. I think it was uh, that there are 68 different extraterrestrial civilizations visiting this earth mm -hmm. and my feeling is give me a break <laughs> once again um you there's it is an unknowable specific if yeah. you were the director of the nsa or the president or a martian or the head of army intelligence you could not know that number and confirm it with any specificity. And it's very irresponsible and just so destructive to the serious work that's being done to put forward numbers like that. I found it, uh, I watched his serious documentary, and I found it very well done. Absolutely terrific um, production values. Exactly. Cost the, uh, a fortune. <laughs> the, the creature they have, the six inch humanoid, is fascinating. <laughs> Uh, but it does seem to represent a genuine anomaly. And, you know, they did the DNA test, and it comes back, well, the mother was human. And he continues with, we have an alien. And I'm like, wait. I know. You know what I thought Didn't you just of. say it was, <laughs> the mother was human? There's a great quote that's attributed to Hermann Goering, the Reich's Minister of Culture, which translates roughly as, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my pistol. And when I hear about a six-inch alien, I reach for mine. All I could think of was um, the great Phineas T. Barnum, before he mm. became known for circus, had a museum in downtown Manhattan on Broadway, a natural history museum 
with anomalies. And one of the biggest draws for quite some time was The Mermaid. Oh, right. And you were ushered into this special room, and there it is in a glass case. It's the bottom of a fish, so to the top of a monkey. (laughs) And then if you griped, you were shown this door to the egress, which was (laughs) self-locking. And, you know, this does not help ufology. (laughs) I'm sorry. If you have an artifact like that, do everything possible to analyze it, to examine it, to really subject it to the most rigorous kind of um, uh, investigation, and then put forward. Yeah. You know, it's just another right this way, folks, kind of thing for me. I'm sorry. Well, it seems like it's a genuine thing, and there have been others <laughs> yeah, found. It's definitely a genuine. Well, thing. I mean, I, I, it almost seems to me like it's legitimate. Like what he has is a legitimate find, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's alien. No. And, and the same with Lloyd Pye and the Star Child skull. Yeah. You know, he has a legitimate anomaly there. I agree. And he immediately jumps to, it's a skull of a gray alien. And it's like, you've just made a huge jump and you're stating this as fact. Also ignoring the fact that a number of cultures that we're aware of, um, Central America in particular comes to mind, the same way that the Chinese in the last century um, because of this forced aesthetic, bound the feet of women. So they would grow in this horribly distorted way and have tiny little feet. Um, there was head binding, skull binding, yes. so that the skull would grow back. I think the Egyptians the at one skulls, period. Yeah. Exactly. And to immediately, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, I will say his, his documentation on showing that it wasn't a cradle boarded skull and yes. stuff is actually quite good. I agree. The and DNA like analysis what. is very interesting. It it's is. not complete. Nope. But that doesn't, you know, and I said to him when I talked to him, but that doesn't, you know, you need an actual gray alien to prove that this was a gray alien. You need to compare it. And he said, well, we have one. And I said, we do. He's like, yeah, the skull. And I went, okay, this this, this is the problem. Your, your work, because it's like any legitimate work he does is going to be marginalized by that jump in logic. It is, Raya. And the fact is that um, all of us in this field, I am. Uh, we have to approach each new investigation with the highest responsible level of skepticism that we're capable of. For people like me, for example, who have been involved in this research for more than 35 years, um, I feel I hit a point years ago where I no longer have the luxury of disbelief Mm -hmm. flat out that nothing's going on. And so, because I know, in quotes, as well as I can, that we are dealing with true anomalous situations here, and I feel a variety of them, Mm -hmm. I always have to begin each new investigation. When I say an investigation, I mean it can be as short as a conversation or as long as the nine years that Larry Warren and I took to write Left at East Gate with the same responsible level of skepticism that anybody off the street would. Um, Otherwise, you're simply going to be, um, you know, another believer. And Lloyd has kind of fallen into this catch-22 because he is such a super specialist at this point. And that skull, for most people, represents everything in his entire you know, catalog of work. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I've investigated quite a number of, well, cases, and in the many years that I worked as the assistant to the late Bud Hopkins, literally several hundred uh, allegations of alien abduction and contact. And for me, um, again, if you get too defensive or too caught up, and then you have something to prove and something to defend as opposed to just doing your best work, taking honest criticism, and being open to you know what people put forward. Uh, if anything, it's going to make you um, a better communicator. Uh, Stanton Friedman spent the weekend with him last week. He's got to be 79 now, and he has still got one of the sharpest minds in the field and I, we chatted about this on and off for years, and he said one of the things is um, when he was in high school, they were debating 
clubs and societies in every school. Mm. Uh, now, critical thinking is not something they're very interested in teaching no. it. Um, so, and yeah. that's unfortunate because people don't know how to how to take these claims and really take them apart. They go with basically what they're told, and if the media makes fun of it. That's what they're going to do. They're, they don't want to take it seriously because they don't want to be the thing that's being made fun of. Yeah. That, the, the ridicule factor for me uh, has been so endemic in this since the summer of 1947. In fact, that is a whole other area of specialty research for me. I became so interested years ago in how did it come to pass that if I ran into you on the street in you know, a different situation said, Hey, Soraya. Um, last night or yesterday afternoon, I was looking up in the sky and I saw this thing that I couldn't identify that moved in a completely non-standard way than aircraft do that we know. And how about that? Instead of you going, yeah, that's interesting, wonder what it was, we have been incredibly conditioned since that summer um, to look at that other person. We watch their mouth move, but we're hearing them saying variations on I want to um, fool you into thinking something that is not true is true, or I've had a tiny electrical synapse blow out in my brain and had a little mini stroke and I'm not quite myself. I've become a total mystic. Um, I want to feel special. I want to be famous. I want to... Um, Wilhelm Reich had a great phrase called evasion of the obvious. And as my old therapist, Dr. Ellsworth F. Baker, used to say sometimes when you have a dream... Uh, about a cigar, it's a dream about a cigar, you know, <laughs> things like that. Right. Um, so we're faced again with deep conditioning post-war um, that it can't be, therefore it isn't, therefore it must be something else. Mm. And nobody likes to look foolish. I think this is actually changing, uh, but it's changing one, two, five, seven people at a time. Right, right. Well, I, th I think also... As much as I hate to say it, the popularity of some of these paranormal TV shows has actually helped change that because it makes people feel more comfortable about believing in it, even if those shows yes, that's right. aren't very good at what they're doing. The X-Files is a perfect example at the high end. Yes. Um, most Americans first heard about a super secret organization that now everybody knows about called the National Security Agency mm -hmm. because... Um, Chris Carter's writers really did their homework. And many of the UFO case investigations that um, were done as treatments on the show that were so entertaining and sometimes really anxiety-provoking was based on research of real events as I know them to be. Uh, my co-author and I were actually approached by Chris Carter's organization in 1994. We still have a few years to go on the book. But they had heard about us, and um, a woman in England, um, Jane, gosh, I forget her name right now, but she wrote the first official X-Files sanctioned book. And it was very well done. They wanted to contrast some of the plots with real stories. So there is a reference to the Rendlesham Forest incident, and mm -hmm. Larry and I get a mention in it of our book that they felt at the time was just about to come out. Well, you know, in the great spectrum of the age of dinosaurs, three years ain't much, so we go pretty close. <laughs> um, and and back, getting back to Rendlesham, mm. I mean, Rendlesham is one of those things where we have a something definitely happened. Just like in Roswell, something definitely happened in Roswell, no matter what way you want to explain it. Something definitely happened in Ros Res Rendlesham, and there's evidence. There's even, I believe, a, a military memo. That mentions it. Yeah, well, there's better evidence than that, but you're talking about something that is commonly referred to as the Halt Memo. Yeah. And that is a one-page um, report uh, that was written about three weeks after the fact by the then deputy base commander, and we should say here that um, RAF Bentwaters, um, and the case is alternately referred to as the Rendlesham Forest Incident or the Bentwaters Incident. Um because RAF Bentwaters, now decommissioned, is right in this famous forest in Suffolk, uh, East Anglia, which is about 70 miles northeast of London. Mm. Anyway, this report um, was written based on Colonel Lieutenant Colonel Halt's own observations as well as reports from others. And although he's the first one to say that it is um, compressed, 
redacted. He only cites two days, except other than three days. It was my co-authors blowing the whistle on this story um, that directly resulted in the freedom of information action that caused the release of that document, which was 30 years ago next month. But in terms of real evidence, you have three nights of events um, with unknowns coming down through the forest, uh, tearing up forest canopy, leaving impressions in the ground with elevated uh, beta and gamma background traces measurable in those impressions in the ground, as well as on the side of trees where bark was ripped off, etc., cetera, um, an extraordinary number of uh, credible witnesses who have come forward to these events. And I, I feel, obviously, I'm biased, none more than my co-author. And let, let me cite some of the evidence. Um, well, I want, you, I want you to, for the people who don't know about the case, I think mm, maybe you should tell people sure. what happened, and then we can get into the evidence. A Sounds bit. good to me. Um, in late December 1980, um, in and around a very uh, militarized area in southeastern England um, known as the Twin Base Complex, RAF Bentwaters, about six miles away, RAF Woodbridge. Bentwaters leased to the Americans since World War II. Woodbridge, um, uh, definitely a British base with some American presence. And the event that kind of kicked it off was um, military um, police observing a light go down in the woods. Uh, there was no sense of a crash. There was no ground concussion, no explosion, no fire. But this is 1980, a rather tense point in the Cold War. And you can't ignore an event like that. And so several of these men radioed in for permission to go in and investigate. In fact, um, two of them are now working with Nick Pope, formerly of the MOD, Ministry mm -hmm. of Defense, and Nick is writing a book about their experiences. It should be out sometime next spring or early, uh, late winter. Anyway, um, they drive in as far as they can in a military vehicle and then walk the rest of the way, and they come upon um, an object, a machine, that is equilateral, triangle, the appearance of very shiny black surface. It tapers upward. It's uh, several meters on each side. And it's just moving very slowly at about chest height through the woods. One of the men um, allegedly, and this is doubly interesting because he is not sure whether he withdrew his sidearm and went into a two-handed stance. Uh, they had missing time. They're still struggling with some of their memories. Um, the other one, the ranking one, um, copied down the, again, call it hieroglyphic symbols, what right. have you, into his field notebook. And then he actually touched the craft, slight hum. Uh, they decided not to fully report what they had seen, fear of ridicule, uh, but they continue to struggle with some of what happened or may not have happened. Uh, Jim, uh, uh, John Penniston, uh, I'm sorry, it's Jim Penniston and John Burroughs. John Burroughs, um, at a conference that we had to mark the 30th anniversary, uh, which would have been in December 2010, back in the village of Woodbridge, the closest location to it, when questioned by the audience, it was very poignant. Uh, he was asked, flat out, John, is it true, as I've heard, that you impulsively jumped on the thing and it went like 10 meters with you before you let go, which he had confided to Larry years before. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing of course, I'm not sure. Hmm. It may have happened or it was an implanted memory and not one implanted by them. But these guys were worked over by, uh, I, I feel a field arm um, of the NSA rather than Air right. Force. And well, make that clear. The the other thing is when you're when you're witnessing something that novel, that different, I would think anyone's not going to remember it as clearly as they think they might. Well, you bring up a great point here, and for me, the best example, and it's only happened to me once in my life, that I happened to be chatting with somebody looking at the road, 
without really thinking about it. And I watched as two cars collided. Mm. And, of course, there's a part of you that goes into shock. There's an adrenaline dump, an epinephrine dump. Exactly. Tunnel vision, auditory exclusion. Um, and if you ask 12 people, they will give you 12 variations. Right. This is beyond that. Also, um, these unknowns came in over the weapons storage area. And one thing that we did break in this story, although unrelated, and this was not something I was thrilled about, but we had to follow things where they were going, mm -hmm. was in 1980, by virtue of our treaty with the United Kingdom, we were not supposed to have nuclear ordinance there. It changed under Reagan and Thatcher. And remember, this happened in December of 80. So it happened technically during the Carter presidency, but in that period of time, right before Reagan right. was sworn in, in January. So before anything f official could have gone through. Yes, yes. And so, um, in fact, we did have a huge amount of nuclear ordnance, mm. and my co-author worked around it. And on that first night, unknowns came in over the weapons storage area, in this case, the nuclear weapons storage area, and I know how this sounds, and frankly, how people receive it is their own business. I would say um, there's a, a very good book out, came out in 2008 by a, a research specialist named Robert Hastings called UFOs and Nukes, mm -hmm. and it's as thick as left at East Gate, and it is an entire, entire book on nuclear-related UFO incidents, of which there have been a tremendous number, a shocking number, in fact, and they shone beams of light down into this area. Now, this was a temperate night in December. Um, there was a tremendous amount of moisture in the air, not uncommon in England. Right. And so the lights were visible as a line right down to the ground. Hmm. And Charles Hall, who denied and then has now gone on record as saying that he understands that this was factual, told Larry and I years ago when we interviewed him in an extensive interview that's in the book, which was done, right, by the way, uh, in a food court in a uh, shopping mall <laughs> called Pentagon City, right across the street from the Pentagon. You live for stuff like that when you're a nonfiction <laughs> writer. And his, his um, very chilling observation was somehow these beams of light adversely affected the ordinance. Mm. Now, second day uh, these things were seen coming in and almost doing kind of grid sweeps over the area a number of them came down uh, again we have that corroborated in fact um, Charles Halt still has one of the castings from one of the impressions and on the third night um, he well on the third night he went out with a number of men and he was a total skeptic about this he had heard the reports, et cetera, but he wanted to disprove this. Uh, and he had a small microcassette recorder with him, as well as they had night scopes and all the other stuff they should have. And one of these things came in right over their heads and shone a beam of light right down to their feet and then kept moving on. Then he and his contingent moved into a farmer's field adjacent to where my co-author had been brought with a number of Air Force security cops and they witnessed nothing less than the landing, although it's a rather complicated the way the thing appeared, of a structured craft of undetermined origin, and beyond that, three beings. Now, that was again in December of 1980, and I've been back to England relative to this subject. I'd have to count up the stamps in my passports, but at least 20 times. Wow. And just in the writing of the book, Larry and I together went back about 15 times on our own, fully only funded by ourselves. I became obsessed, not necessarily in a healthy way, but it was an important story. Oh, sure. And I'm proud to have helped tell it. And that very first time that we walked out to that field, I had a micro cassette recorder in each pocket, you know, machines break down. And in that period of years, I recorded everything. I knew I was going to be drawing from interviews and from dialogue and conversations. And Larry was somewhat, you know, withdrawn. This was a very intense moment for me. I hadn't been back there in eight years and two months. His life had changed in that field that night. And I know where we're going for seven months already. I've been doing the armchair phase of the research. Mm -hmm. 
And when the forest cover kind of broke through and I saw the field for the first time, I knew just where I was. Mm. There's the stand of trees. There's the farmer's house. There's the oak tree that they used, Larry used as a reference that night. And all this is recorded. And his arm shoots out reflexively. And he just points out in the field 100 feet or so, and he says, it sat right there. This transcription's all in the book. And I should also add, it has been voice stress analyzed twice by two independent Mm. practitioners. And then there's several prolonged seconds of silence on the tape. Now, we're looking at a plowed field in winter, no foliage. And he says, but of course, it's a coincidence that that where it sat, where I'm pointing, there's sort of an elliptical discoloration. Now, because I've trained myself the way I have and had terrific mentors, my first reaction was not, oh, my God, a trace case is what we call a case where there is uh, true physiological changes because of anomalous activity to organic Mm -hmm. material. My first thought was, yeah, that is an amazing coincidence, but there's reasons for that. We're looking at clods of dirt on an overcast day. I don't know whether it's, you know, slightly convex. It could be a play of light. Uh, A, a, you know, a ton of nitrate fertilizer could have been dumped there six months ago and not fully graded out. Lightning could have struck it. But the more we walked around the field and observed it, it continued to look different. I was shooting a couple of rolls of 35 millimeter film. You remember that? Some of your younger listeners may not. And you remember they used to come in those cool little plastic containers, and right. I had about half a dozen of them with them. And because of the micro cassette, I had tiny little labels and a pen, of course. And I walked right into the discolored area and took a sample, then walked out 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, took other samples, and we had a chance to compare them, and they looked different. They felt different. Ultimately, we got back to the B&B. We did a little experiment, got two equal-sized jar lids and a tablespoon, and I mixed an equal amount of water with the discolored sample and with one of the control samples. All the control samples went to mud very quickly. The, I will now call it the affected sample, I couldn't get it to become mud. I worked hmm. it with the back of that spoon like an apothecary, it either sunk to the bottom in clumps or floated like dust on the top. So we were very excited. We knew we had something. And when I got back to the States with like six little film containers full, (laughs) I contacted a laboratory that did analysis and explained that I wanted this stuff analyzed. And the nice lady on the phone said, how much do you have? And I said, six 35 millimeter film canisters. And she said as nicely as they could, You've never done this before, have you, sir? I said, no. She said, we need between 15 and 20 pounds of dirt. Mm. I went back. I went back again, this time with two quart laboratory heavy gauge plastic containers. Mm -hmm. I followed their directions. I came back through Kennedy Airport with 20 pounds of dirt in my bag. (laughs) And as we're handed out our little check-in forms, I think for the first time, Yes, no vegetables, no fruit, no sausages, you know, not more than $10,000. And there it was. It said soil. And I thought, oh, man, I so don't want to go through whatever they're going <laughs> to. And I thought they're never going to check. You know, it's pre-9-11. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, good, I'm not going to. But you know what? As we get closer to the airport, I thought, damn. I thought worse than damn. I thought, <laughs> if we ever finish this book and if it gets published and if people read it, Somebody with a good, sharp mind may say, hmm, Robbins claims that he brought back 20 pounds Mm. of soil. I'm going to uh, do a FOIA with the State Department and go through records, see if he declared that soil, which would be, I give me, who knows, misdemeanor felony. I could have infected the whole America with some terrible British germs. (laughs) And so I reluctantly checked it. And I, I won't belabor the story, but I was sequestered with my dirt. And the uh, uh, the official that brought me in, <laughs> what is this for? <laughs> Research for a book. What's your book about? Something that happened to my co-author. I strung him along as well. <laughs> Finally, well, he alleges that when he was in the I see. Thank you very much. And uh, wait right here. Close the door. Click. I'm locked in with my dirt. <laughs> he returns a few minutes later with three other people in uniform. 
and says, right, what's the name of the laboratory that this is being FedEx to tomorrow, which I had told him. He said, Springborn Environmental Laboratory and we're in Massachusetts. He takes down a loose leaf. Okay, that's accredited. He said, okay, tell us. I said, tell you what? He said, tell us the story about the UFO. <laughs> and 15 minutes later, we had four new fans and they wished us well. That's um, awesome. <laughs> but what's more awesome is the results that we got from that test. And in fact, even though that was like 18 years ago, last weekend in Portland at this conference, I spent part of it with the scientist who did the analysis, hmm. who has gone on to, he has a straight job always, but he's, he's done other stuff like this. The things that he was able to establish was that there were macroscopic particles in this soil that were metallic, not uncommon in that part of England, and that in the affected area, it was plus four times the amount, as in the control samples. Mm. What he deduced from that was something had exerted such a powerful electromagnetic effect, it had pulled those tiny little sand-sized grains through soil, which is quite mm. a trip. Um, seed germination tests each time resulted in much slower growth and only mutant strains of what they planted, wheat, rye, barley, whatever, wow. emerged. And when I went back to get the samples, it was June. It's nine and a half years after the events now. I'll show you the picture sometime. The entire field is yellow. It's gone to hay except for that big oval so, ellipse. It's bright green. Um, oh, man. The color was very different. They couldn't get the soil to hydrate. It had been just blasted. For me, the most dramatic aspect was there was a lot of silica in the soil. And he said there was none in the affected sample. Uh, it had been reduced to, uh, his phrase was an interim form of glass. The sand had melted on that spot. Now, for me, evidence varies in different situations. Sure. But the fact that... This field has been the, the named location for that third night's event. The fact that Larry, with me to observe him, after eight years and two months, my second trip to England, uh, he again was deployed there, his physical reaction as we got to that point, the way his arm shot out, the tone of his voice, the fact that the voice had been voice stress analyzed, and that the exact spot that he pointed to had that many physiological changes, that is the best kind of triangulation that you can look for in a situation like this. Yeah. All right, we got to take a quick minute break. We'll be back in a minute with uh, Peter Robbins. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. In 2013, Mysteries of the Past will reshape our future. Paradigm Symposium 2013 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, October 17th through the 20th. Speakers will include Scott Walter of History Channel's America Unearthed, Egyptologist Robert Bavall, Dr. Robert Schock, and many more. Tickets are available online at ParadigmSymposium.com. Mankind's Greatest Mysteries, brought to the present with new understanding. Visit ParadigmSymposium.com. All right, and we are here on Where Did the Road Go with Peter Robbins in studio, which is awesome. <laughs> it's so much more comfortable to have a guest in studio. It, it's more personable. It's, it's just a more comfortable situation. It's like real human communication. I, I know. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. A, a tremendous simulation. It's like you're right there. <laughs> uh, and no, nothing against technology. I mean, without Skype, we wouldn't be able to do a show like this. We wouldn't have the ability to, say, call someone in Peru or in England so easily. It's and, and wonderful. Talk to, yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't replace just being able to have someone sit down right there with you. Yeah. It's good. Um, now, and in this spacious multi-million dollar studio. Yes. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's like a mansion. It's amazing. <laughs> Go away, girls. We'll run. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so with Rendlesham, mm -hmm. um, I remember, uh, and I, I've heard so much about Rendlesham over the years. Now, the, the last thing I read about it was Andrew Collins' take on it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. He uh, and one of the things he talked about is how the how one of them kind of exploded and just disappeared. Is that ring a bell? Well, the craft on the third night, if this is what Andrew is referring to, I, I think forget. so. It's been a while. Um, these men were taken off their postings at RAF Bentwaters. This was a particularly rough moment in the Cold War. And in fact, I encourage any of your readers to go to um, the headlines to the largest paper they have access to. The story that last week in December 1980, as far as international affairs, was the Soviets were very concerned with a pro-democracy movement that was spreading out of the Gdansk shipyards in Poland. And I think the concern had elevated to such a level that they were, um, hoping, well, it, it could have become another Hungarian revolution, mm. a la 1956. What we the people were not aware of at the time that we've been able to confirm since was at that point in December, the Soviets had massed more than 100,000 infantry and tank troops on the Polish border. And had the situation gotten out of hand, they would have rolled in. Mm. And if they had, America had, a very made it, had already made it clear that they would side with the Poles. Now, the leader um, of this movement was a union, elect well, uh, an electrician um, named Lech Walesa, who went on to become the first democratically elected president of Poland. And if you had been in um, a security situation at RAF Bentwaters, you would have seen that literally all of their fighter aircraft were gone. They were deployed to forward operating locations in West Germany, and they were ready to roll. Mm. And that night, the third night's incident, um, the men in um, um, the um, 81st Security Police uh, in the D unit were told that they should really be on guard. Every single guard post was manned. Usually that was not the case. And Larry was at the most farthest one from, you know, the center of, of the uh, the base. In fact, it was little more than an old World War II kind of pillbox. Mm. He had his M16 and his Motorola radio and be told to observe. You know, There was a slim, a remote possibility that the Soviets might drop paratroopers in the U.K., Mm. That's how tense it was. So that's part of the backstory that this was set against. And he and other men were taken off their posts. They were all brought to the base motor pool where they loaded up light alls, um, the military equivalent of the big click lights we associate with old Hollywood premieres, gas operated. Mm -hmm. And they topped off the tanks and they brought them off base in a convoy to an area about a mile from RAF Woodbridge. They went up a logging road, vehicles pulled in, uh, an armorer's vehicle pulled up, men were disarmed. Technically, they were in treaty violation leaving that base with loaded weaponry. Mm. They were broken into three men group Soraya and ordered to head in that way and investigate a disturbance. And as they moved into the area, the static electricity charge in the air was so ferocious. These are young guys. Um, 18, 19, 20 with very healthy heads of hair. This was not a unit that wore helmets. They wore berets. And um, I've had more than one account of the static electricity starting to push the berets off their heads. That's major. Wow. And once they came through the forest and into Capel Green, which is the name of the farmer's field where this happened, they observed something quite anomalous. It was a ground fog that was oval in shape and that was self-illuminated. And they were, it was also a night where there was um, uh, no moon and literally no ambient light. They're a mile from the nearest base. There's a tiny farmhouse. Windows on the second floor are lit up. It's midnight after. And they're ordered to surround the ground fog, which they do. And after a while, they all observed as a small reddish light came in from the direction of the North Sea, 
and ultimately came in over the field and over that spot. And while they were watching it without a sound, it exploded with such magnesium brightness. Uh, some of the descriptions I've heard were like a, a wall of flash bulbs. Mm. And you know, you're, for several seconds, you've got to readjust. You're, you're not able to see. And when their eyes readjusted, there was this machine sitting in the fog. Mm. Now, one more piece of corroborating evidence about that spot. I know anecdotally that other men's eyes were affected, and forever. Uh, Larry said his eyes started to hurt. The pupils were very dry. He could almost hear it when he blinked. Mm. And within 24 hours requested... Um, an examination and uh, whatever um, at the ear clinic, at the eye clinic, which would have been at uh, RAF Lincoln Heath. Being the military, it took about five weeks, but we were able to secure his Air Force Form 490, which documents that visit. And in the physician's handwriting, what is written is Opti slash Ret Burn EXP, Optical Retinal Burn Exposure. His retinas were not burned when he went into the service. That would have been picked up in his right, regular right. Air Force uh, in physical. So yet one more thing. But maybe that's what Andrew is referring to there. No, that, that could have been. I know. Well, I thought he. I. I want to say I thought he said it disappeared by just kind of exploding outwards. But I don't think he mentioned a craft afterwards. Well, remember also that we're dealing with variations on events that went on over three consecutive nights. Right, right. And he may be referring to another one. Um, I'm not sure. And the, the, the sort of throwaway skeptic, and I, I use the word skeptic. Debunker. Debunker, yeah. denialist. Yeah. Not, not really, they know. not a true skeptic. Well, um, um, debunkers fascinate me because they know like Dr. Greer knows that there are, you know, almost 70 civilizations visiting Earth, they know that there's nothing really going on. Right. Their job is to gently explain to us how deluded we are and why and what we may be misinterpreting. Right. So the, but their explanation for this is that these people simply saw a lighthouse. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> now, on many of my, on all my visits to the area, I mean, again, uh, it'll, it'll haunt me for the rest of my life. I always return to the field. Mm -hmm. And I've been there at day and at night every time of year. And then, of course, the leaves were down, although a lot of the trees are um, evergreen. And they're talking about the Orford Nest Lighthouse, I don't know, about 10 miles away. Right. And there was even um, an interesting little film clip showing um, the pulse, so to say. Uh, as it goes around, you see this flash of light way in the distance. Mm -hmm. However, to suggest that these highly trained military observers, uh, after all, even though they're young, they're trained to work around nuclear weaponry or in anti-terrorism, which was the case with some in this unit. Also, I should say, in guard mount, the process they go through before they actually go on guard duty. If they have had a sip of beer at lunch, or they have um, the sniffles and they've taken the smallest size over-the-counter cold pill like a contact or something, they are not put on shift mm. that night. There is absolutely no room. Um, and again, to suggest that they confused the flash of a lighthouse through the trees 10 miles away with a landed strange object on the ground would be funny if it wasn't so incredibly insulting. Well, yeah. The late Phil Klass, the king of debunkers for many years, um, he suggested that they were blown joints in the woods. Um, again, this is beyond belief to me that anybody would insult our troops like that. It could not, it did not, it would not have happened. Not, not only that, but it's, it's, it's a way of just kind of throwing it away without any evidence to support what they're saying. Well, who needs it? It's a UFO story. We all know that's nonsense. Hey, yeah, exactly. Also, two of my other favorites is that there was a, um, like a pickup truck with fertilizer in it and it caught on fire. And so they um, misunderstood that this truck full of burning dung was an anomalous machine mm. and um, that there were police cars in the area. There were no police cars out in that field that night, but that somehow they confused that. 
or I mean, again, these things are incredibly um, insulting. Yeah. Uh, a man um, who was a um, worked for the Forestry Commission and has kind of built part of his career on being a uh, a respectful skeptic suggested that these impressions in the ground, which were in an equilateral triangle in one case, were created by burrowing rabbits who obviously understood geometry and were slightly radioactive. Mm. Mm, why not? <laughs> it's preferable to what I'm putting forward, I guess. Yeah, well, so, so often you get explanations that are more ridiculous than, than the actual events that are reported to explain away the events. Indeed. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, and if you it's can't, just amazing. If you can't fully attack with any effectiveness the event, then you go after the individual. Oh, sure. And uh, my co-author, more than anyone, because he had the courage to come forward on this. He left the service feeling a tremendous amount of pressure six months after the event with a fully honorable discharge and a pretty impressive case of post-traumatic stress disorder, not because mm. of the event, but because of what he was put through 24, 36 hours later, which mm. was horrendous, uh, chemically subdued against his will, brought to a facility below this base and subjected to a process that quite a number of the men have come forward on, which I call Disneyland on acid, um, to upfuse, confuse their actual memories with implanted memories, I think with the purpose of putting the fear of God into them about not breaking security, or if they did, that the, what would come out of their mouths would sound so loopy that they'd be dismissed anyway. And ultimately, he was the one who found that investigator, gave him a fully account, outed everybody, which did not result in good feeling with some of these guys who still are on his case and suggests that he was the one who was kind of Manchurian candidated and that his account is the false account because it is dramatic. But again, none of them can supply any physical evidence. We have supplied all the physical evidence in this case so far that builds a case for that part of the third night. We certainly have other physical evidence. Okay. And uh, you're on WVBR FM Ithaca. This is Where Did the Road Go? We're going to talk a few more minutes with Peter before we get into the last exit for the lost. Um, and obviously, all this stuff is outlined in your book. Now, when did the book get published? The book was first published here and in the UK in the summer of nine. Well, here in uh, late spring, uh, I'm sorry, late winter, early spring 97, with an awful publisher who. Uh, it was one step away from being a felon. I, we brought them to court ultimately, and they declared Chapter 11, and that was that. Um, the British publisher, Small Press, Michael O'Mara Press, published it in June of 97, and they really helped make that book uh, a major bestseller in the United Kingdom. It was republished here and abroad in an expanded and updated edition in 2005 that's available from Cosmo Books and will be in print in perpetuity and we remain very proud of the book okay um has a lot happened since the book came out on this case quite a bit um other witnesses have come forward um there have been accounts that have backed up and confirmed larry's other ones that question it um a uh, again another book is being written right now on it and i don't think this one will ever go away soraya it is, it still is so emotional for these guys. And they are still suffering to a degree. I mean, every single one of them that I've talked to who was directly involved, one, two marriages gone, not that that is a direct result necessarily, but anomalous health problems, um, the kind of disturbances that you associate with combat veterans, um, anger issues, rage issues, violence, um, substance abuse, alcoholism, uh, you name it. Mm. And they all remain quite obsessed, the ones I've spoken with. Um, other ones have done their best to go on with their lives. But this is the story that marks their kind of personal BC and AD, that yeah. turning point in their lives where everything changed forever and not for the better. 
the, now the area where this happened, does this have any history of anomalous lights or strange? Major history, major. In fact, um, one of the things I was proudest of getting was um, a former National Security Agency employee uh, was kind enough to give me a fully written report on what is now, it's a famous case, it's in Blue Book, uh, involving that same area in 1956, a major UFO overflight that was observed from the ground by civilian and military personnel, that was observed from the air by pilots, that had radar registration that was going 4,000 miles an hour, and reports of a much more um, pronounced number in that part of England that continue to come in. It is a very active area. Plus, it is an area with a long history of anomalous activity, of Wiccan tradition, of just a lot of wonderfully spooky stuff. In fact, um, my brother-in-law is here in the studio with us now, and he spent some time with Larry and I in England, and the B&B we used to stay at, there was a presence in that house. Hmm. And I'm not a ghost person. It's I, I respect what I don't understand to start with, and I leave mm -hmm. it to the research specialists. But um, it made itself known to many people year after year while that house was a B&B, &B, nothing malevolent, but too many corroborating stories from people from so many places who could not have known each other, sometimes a year apart, this person from Germany, this person from Brooklyn. Um, yes, the area is alive. And I would say also to anyone um, who is even vaguely interested in this stuff. It's a wonderful part of England to visit. Mm. It's beautiful, it's historic, it's less than two hours from London, and it's well known for some other things as well. Bird watchers from all over the world flock, I couldn't help it, uh, to that area because it's so pronounced. It's got great architecture, um, but the military presence has been there since before World War I. Mm. NSA listening posts, American and British facilities, it's a loaded area. Now, if you feel that the phenomena is extraterrestrial based, why do you think it's, it, it focuses on certain areas? Well, um, I absolutely don't know it's extraterrestrial okay. based. Right, I, right. But it, if you go with that theory, yeah. why would it focus on certain areas? Damned if I know. Okay. Um, we call them windowed. <laughs> I'm very good at saying I don't know, uh, unlike some great. of my colleagues. Um, we call those things window areas. Mm -hmm. In New York State, Little Pine Bush, New York, um, several hours drive from here has the highest by far corroborated instances of documented multiply witnessed UFO sightings anywhere in New York. In um, Scotland it's a small town called, I forget the name, but it's yet one more single area. Um, Again, is this a, a dimensional portal? Is there something in the area that interests them? I can tell you for a fact, because it's statistically unquestionable, that we have elevated areas of observations of unknown activity in the sky around nuclear facilities all over the world, military and civilian. Right. I can also tell you that the great East Coast blackout of 1965 um, this only because a good friend of mine and one of my mentors was a New York City police detective and a crack UFO investigator, had brother officers who were stationed around the Indian Point nuclear plant at the time, as police always are stationed around nuclear mm -hmm. plants around this country, and they observed UFOs over that plant when the lights went out. Mm -hmm. Now, I am not saying at all that they made it go out. I'm saying that that's what those police officers told my friend. And of course, when it appears in print, it just looks loopy and ludicrous and so theatrical. But, but, but you know, facts are facts at the is. same time. And we're dealing with an alternate history here of post-war reality. Um, it's the one just below the surface that you have to dig a little, but it is as real as us sitting in the studio here now. We're not alone, and what else is new? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Um, so, uh, Paul Devereaux, are you familiar with his work? Oh, yes. And where he's shown that UFO light 
encounters line up along fault lines and stuff, which I've always yes. found very fascinating. Indeed. And to me, that lends more to a to a interdimensional explanation. Over even if they are extraterrestrial, they're they're not just flying here. Maybe they're coming in through something. Using um, Earth energies of some kind. It may well be, Soraya. And I, I respect um, Devereux and his writings. Um, in England, of course, you have the phenomena of ley lines, right. which are fascinating ancient old paths, many of them gun sites, straights, hundred, you know, for several hundred miles. Mm -hmm. A few of them picking up on the coast of France and Brittany and continuing on into Europe. There was something going on thousands of years ago where... You know, you can run a string, hypothetically, 100 miles. You can't do it across the English Channel. <laughs> and so there was an overview here. Um, I, I still think it's so interesting that so many intelligent, well-educated academics, many of them with advanced degrees, refuse to acknowledge there were sophisticated civilizations on this planet going back, say, before the Sumerians. Why? because they can see no evidence of it, ignoring the fact completely that there have been Earth cataclysms repeatedly over the millennium right. that have fully destroyed civilizations. And some people prefer to think about it as mythology, but stuff's been going on here for an awfully long time. Yeah, now, now they have Gobekli Tepe staring them in the face and they don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> a friend of mine visited there last summer really? and gave me um, a wonderful documentary, a documentary on it. Unfortunately, most of it's in Turkish. But I'll be happy to loan it to you. There are some sub subtitles. Yeah, and we're talking here about the oldest temple now established, what, 14,000 years old or yeah, something? Yeah, uh, that, in was, that was intentionally buried, which makes it all the weirder. Exactly, exactly. It wasn't just covered up by time. They said, okay, we're done. Let's bury it for yeah. whatever reason to protect it. A little time or, capsule there yeah. for future beings on the earth, or we're and, done with it. <laughs> and, and who knows what else is out there like that. It took just us so. this long just to find that. Exactly. And that was just a fluke. The farmer hit the stone, started to dig it up, and went, what is this? And, of course, people like John Anthony West and um, his wonderful uh, uh, Robert Blaval. Robert Blaval, yeah. Uh, who um, will be at the uh, the Paracon uh, next uh, month. Oh, Paradigm, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, these people have thrown such a wrench into classical Egyptology. Yeah. And what's his name? That wonderful, very personable, very passionate... Uh, Graham Hancock? No, well, Grandma as well, but I'm thinking of um, the head of the Egyptian historical. Oh, um, he just wants these people, I'm sure, murdered and <laughs> lost in the desert. You know. Well, he's not there anymore. Oh, interesting. I, that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, but to um, suggest that these, you know, the pyramid and the Sphinx predate what we'll call Egypt. Yeah. Uh, is problematic for many. Well, when, when I've had Robert Schock on, he said that when he originally presented the evidence that the Sphinx was older, he thought he was doing the Egyptologists a favor. He was giving them more history. Yeah. He didn't expect the backlash exactly. of, you know, you're, what are you doing? And he was that like... the erosion is, is, is water-driven erosion. Yeah, rain-driven, dri to be specific. And Exactly. And that we have not had that kind of rain in thousands of yeah. years predating. Well, I guess if I was an Egyptian, I'd feel not happy about that. <laughs> you know, we made the Sphinx, didn't we? Yeah. But, well, someone still made it in Egypt. It still could be a relative of the people who are there now. Absolutely. It's just Absolutely. a matter of we don't know what culture, and it, it very likely could connect to the Gobekli Tepe culture. It might even be well older. Well, that's true. That's and very true. For me, um, all of these things that we're talking about, anybody can have an opinion. Unfortunately, many people have an opinion without having educated themselves enough to have an educated opinion. Right. <clears throat> and, you know, damn it, I'm an American and I'm going to have my opinion about anything <laughs> I want. My feeling is we're never going to get to the bottom of the roots of many of these mysteries in our lives. And does that mean we should feel frustrated or, you know, rage at the universe or, you know, call the people that bring forward evidence of things that makes us anxious, you know, that we're a bunch of cranks or something? I think it adds to the richness and the mystery that's life. And, you know, sometimes understanding is the booby prize. Just to appreciate a mystery for what it is or true, what it may be. True. If we had no mysteries left, it would be a far less interesting world. I agree. All right. Now, I had, I had hoped tonight to talk to you about Wilhelm Reich, who uh, <coughs> has some very fascinating work that most people have never heard of. 
Um, I actually have a guest on in a few weeks, Randall Carlson, who also knows a decent amount about Reich, who was going. But I'm not sure he's coming from the same direction you are. You've done some work, and have you written a book, or have you just done papers on Reich? I've done quite a number of papers on Reich, but I was introduced to his work when I was a teenager. When I was in my late twenties, um, I was amazed to learn that his former first assistant for the last eleven years of his life, the man that he charged with the future legacy of the work who was quite advanced in age at that point. And by the way, he would have had two UFO sightings on his own, one with Reich, uh, whose scientific reputation in part was uh, torpedoed toward the end of the life by having the courage and, let's say, the combination of naivety to publish around his UFO observations. Right. But um, I went into therapy with Dr. Baker. In those years, um, I was fortunate enough and diligent enough to seek out many of the people who had trained with Reich or been patients of his or students of his or what have you. And I lecture every few years usually at a a Reich symposium or international conferences on his work and discoveries. And I'm very excited to say in uh, about three weeks I'll be doing just that, presenting three papers at an international conference on uh, Reich's work in Rome. And I don't mean Rome, New York. Yeah, I didn't think you did. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad his name's still out there. Well, in Europe especially, um, there's tremendous interest, and it's still seen as very political. The left claim him from his very early years. The right claim him from the more mature years. Uh, There is a much more um, active scientific community there replicating his work all over Mm -hmm. Europe. Two years ago, I spoke at a conference in central Greece, and I was amazed at the number of people very knowledgeable on the subject and how many of his books were available translated into Greece into Greek I've spoken at a Reich symposium in Nice France a number around the country unfortunately the problem is that most people have never read any of Dr. Reich's actual writings they've read about Dr. Reich or heard about him or um, you know slander the very simple but very powerful uh, energy focusing devices that he did create i've used them on and off since i was a teenager and they're mm-hmm. very real the science that he developed is simply about the study of how energy functions so it crosses over every scientific discipline and um i would encourage anybody that's curious about dr reich to get out there and seek out his books on the internet and just type his name into a good search engine in the author, not the subject title, although there's a handful of good books on him for sure. Right, right. But he's, he's one of those people who, who did some really interesting work that most people have never heard about. That's right. And so we'll have to have you back so we can do a, a whole show on right because that shouldn't be I a problem. I can't believe it. I get to come back to the studio. It's great. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it when the weather gets colder. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, and do you have anything else coming up? Um, yeah, I'll be speaking at a um, conference in uh, Lemonster, Massachusetts, coming up in November. Uh, It's called the New England UFO Conference. Uh, Google it. Come if you can. I'm hoping to be uh, at the Paradigm Conference coming up. Ah, yes, uh, in October. Yeah, exactly. And um, I can't actually confirm that now. I should know in a week or so. Nice. Um, My website is down right now, but uh, anybody can... Friend me on Facebook, okay. and being that there are other people named Peter Robbins, one of them who's my Facebook friend, uh, <laughs> I'm the one just outside of Ithaca, New York, and uh, be glad to uh, be your friend at a distance, and who knows, maybe in real life. All right, okay. Uh, any idea when your website will be up? Yeah, um, probably by, before the end of the year. Okay, all right. And uh, books, you obviously left it left. Uh, I've got several that I'm slowly working away on, but I just seem to keep getting caught up in yet one more conference paper, one more <laughs> column, one more commentary. Uh, okay. So is, yeah. is Left at Westgate the only one you have actually published? Left at Eastgate, yeah. Eastgate. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Yeah, not bad. You were one direction <laughs> off. I had it right the very first time and then corrected myself to make it wrong, and now I've gotten it wrong completely. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. I do that all the time with stuff. (laughs) But yeah, um, I'll be very proud of that book, uh, along with my co-author, Larry Warren, for the rest of our lives, no question about it. As you should be. 
All right. So you're going to stick around a little for the last exit. We're going to talk about UFOs in media and culture, correct? For for a little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, not for a long time. Okay. But there's, there's some more lighthearted stuff we could talk about. Yeah. You know. And so uh, we will be back uh, next week with David Politis. We'll be talking about the missing 411 stuff, people disappearing in national parks uh, with no good explanation. It's some really creepy stuff and kind of important stuff that people should know about. And uh, The Last Exit for the Lost is up next. If you're listening to this on the podcast, whatever we talk about in The Last Exit with Peter, I'll kind of stick at the end of the podcast there for you. And uh, we're going to hear some UFO-oriented stuff right after the uh, Psyche Corporation here to take us out. ...and hypocrisy with Roswell 47. And we still have Peter here from Where the Road Go. And we were going to talk briefly about uh, UFOs in the media. And like culture and movies and stuff like that. And you mentioned during our interview during where the road go close encounters, I believe. Or no, maybe you didn't. Maybe you mentioned that privately when we were talking off air. Um, how do you feel? Do you feel that UFOs are represented well in the media? Um, rarely. They're represented major, of course. And we've had more films than anybody can count <clears throat> that deal with the subject from the totally loopy and goofy to ones that are very compelling. Mm. Um, we've also had wonderful and crappy television treatments of the subject as well. <laughs> uh, again, because um, nobody can state with absolute authority what's going on. It's been such a rich area to explore, but I grew up with um, the old black and white movies from the late 50s, oh, right, early right, 60s. Right. Uh, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, and of course the legendary um, um, invasion, well, Invaders from Mars was another mm -hmm, terrific mm -hmm. one. The remakes for me are all pretty awful. Yes. Um, the Day the Earth Stood Still, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yep. When I studied film at the School of Visual Arts, one of the things that they kept trying to drive home about these films was that they were allegories for creeping communism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the lack of emotion and the collective groupthink and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And, of course, you know, there is something to that. But that one point where I raised my hand, being an authority on this subject, uh, already immersed in it for about a year, and asked uh, my teacher, who went on to become a legendary film critic and writer, Dr. Peter Biskin, how he felt about just the possibility that some of these films were based on the fact, the possibility that these things happened. Right. He gave me a look. <laughs> and he never even bothered to add words to the look. It said everything. <laughs> you know, um, for me, it's such an underpinning of popular culture. Uh, One-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater, you know, um, you didn't need Megadeth on that. Um, <laughs> and by the way, I have not only been in the hangar in Roswell, New Mexico, hmm. Um, where certainly the crash debris and allegedly the bodies were taken. <clears throat> but just as a little postscript to post-war history, that would have been July of 1947. In August of 1945, a B-29 left from that hangar, flew to California where a special weapon was loaded on it and flew on to Japan. The Enola Gay first departed that hangar in Roswell, New Mexico. Because mm. the 509th Bomb Group was the only nuclear strike force in the world. Right. And yeah. a lot of us theorize that that first bit of interest uh, focused on that tiny little sleepy area was that reason. Interesting. Yeah. But uh, I, I, think, I think something like Megadeth writing about Hangar 18 brings it into... To Brings it out to people that may have not heard of it before, never yeah. thought about it, and gives it some level of respectability to those people if these guys are taking it serious. And it was a huge hit for them as yeah. on top of that. In the later 70s, the great Blue Oyster Cult had a song called ETI, Extraterrestrial Intelligence, written by their legendary uh, producer, um, Sandy Perlman. And Sandy consulted me to get declassified documents to go over to give it a more authentic feel. I think it's the first song uh, about uh, men in black. Mm. And, of course, it's a very popular franchise, those films. Right. But I think they overshadowed one of the most hysterically funny extraterrestrial-related films in history, which was Mars Attacks. 
which I still, I can't even say the word without cracking up. I absolutely you know, love that one. That, those are my favorite bad aliens, but much more terrifying is the idea of Jack Nicholson as president. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and after he gives them another chance, and they come to Congress and then kill everybody in Congress. <laughs> He goes on TV, my fellow Americans, you know, we had a little setback here, a little misunderstanding. <laughs> and then he uses that great meatloaf line, but two out of, we still got the judicial and the executive and two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that movie. And the fact that they had all these major stars and they just killed them all off right away. Oh, that was joyous. That was high comedy. And again, I'm a fan of the Men in Black films. I think they're oh, so great am I. fun. Yeah. But Mars Attacks was in a class by itself. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, fun, it's funny to see how much this has influenced our culture, even to people who don't necessarily realize it. Soraya, do you remember a film, I think it was in the early 80s, called Strange Invaders? It had... Rings a bell. Yeah. Um, it had Paul Lamatt. You'd recognize him if you saw him in a second. And... Brian De Palma's wife, Karen Allen, not Karen Allen, um, uh, uh, Deb, Debbie Allen, I forget, but it's about a little town somewhere in the Midwest, and it's like 1957, and everything is very archetypical, and people, a UFO comes in, and people just disappear, and are replaced by replacements, mm. and then it jumps to the present. And uh, the only real information coming out on UFOs, which they also use this wonderful device in Men in Black, is with their send-up of the National Enquirer. That's the only paper that publishes the truth about it. <laughs> but, of course, it's perfect because everybody ignores it because they think it's nonsense. Right, right. And it's about exploring that. Yes, Strange Invaders. Mm. Uh, I know I've heard of it. Very thoughtful, at times allergic, very moving and very goofy, low budget, but really a thoughtful one. There's also a film about the crash, allegedly in 1897, oh, of yeah, a UFO yeah, in, in a Texas. rural town. Exactly. This one um, you should ask Nick Redfern about. Mm. Uh, and this is one that is somewhat well documented. In fact, the local individuals were so taken by this little being that when it died, they buried him in the local cemetery. Mm -hmm. And then when government people came in to try to disinter, they encased the entire grave in concrete huh. so that people would leave it alone. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I recently rewatched E.T., and I watched it at the Bryant Park Film Festival in New York where about 7,000 of us maniacs sat right after dark, right behind the main branch library. And there came that moment when little Drew Barrymore, six years old, remember that was her premiere film. She sees E.T. and she screams. And E.T. sees her and he screams. <laughs> and she sees him. And on cue, all 7,000 of us screamed each time. Uh, that's movie watching. <laughs> Do you think Spielberg did a fair job to... Uh UFOs? Well, I, I think Close Encounters um, was incredibly well researched. I think Spielberg um, and people in my field debate this back and forth forever. Um, did he have an experience? Did he have a sighting? If you look at his catalog, there's a respectable percentage of films that keep coming back to this subject. Yeah. And E.T. really was, I, I, Close Encounters really was a landmark film in terms of so many details that we have in the literature, that incredible sequence with Richard Dreyfus in the cab of his truck mm. and the sunburn. Um, one of the things that happened in um, the Rendlesham Forest incident was the only woman who has been documented as being involved, Sergeant Bonnie Tamplin, I think was her name. Uh, she was in the area in a pickup truck and what we would now call an orb flew into it and it emotionally destabilized her enough that she had to leave the service. Wow. Uh, she has made some statement in the last few years but not gone into detail. Uh, I also found that incredibly moving. Also the fact that Alan Hynek, uh, who was the certainly the most famous man in the history of UFO studies in the Western world at the time the film came out, 
with a very colorful background. He is the uh, director of astronomy studies at Northwestern and was also working directly with the CIA in the early 50s, um, which is documented in a, mm -hmm. a Robertson panel report from 53, I think, creating a quote-unquote educational program. And it's the first use of the word debunking I've ever seen in the English language to educate people to what UFOs really are, which is anything but that stuff. <clears throat> but he had an epiphany in um, 71 or 72 and basically walked away from that, yeah. embarrassing the government. But there he is in the control room playing himself. And was it Godard or the other major French um, director was also in that room essentially playing Jacques Vallée. Right, yeah. Um, no, he really did his homework, and it's a film that bears rewatching. Uh, I thought it was very intelligent. I remember seeing it with my girlfriend at the time in Princeton and walking out of that theater and remembering a famous story that I had heard from, you hear it over the years, that um, President Reagan screened that film when it came out, before it came out in the White House uh, with a selected audience and allegedly was overheard saying only a handful of people know how true this real story is. Mm. Again, this is the stuff of myth, confabulation, right, legend. Right, right. Who knows? But Reagan was certainly aware of the situation and kept going on record and using UFOs and space allegorically. Right. Fascinating. Gave a major speech before the uh, 43rd session of the General Assembly. I often wonder what if we learned <laughs> that we were facing, wouldn't we all then? Well, well, hey, if you go with the Illuminati uh, version of that that was just to prepare us for a false flag UFO attack and that, that will happen after the terrorists get you know we get done with the terrorism thing yep and that is the phrase of the year false flag <laughs> I'm <laughs> uh, and okay so here's here's a question for you now this is uh, what you've done tons of conferences and stuff what is the strangest thing that ever happened to you at one of these conferences oh boy nobody ever asked me that question well, in terms like sort of some paranormal weirdness or something. Anything. Nothing. <laughs> um, I have met some extraordinarily memorable people. Uh, <laughs> and, oh, gosh. Well, I'll tell you one quick story. Okay. I spoke at a conference many years ago, and I, I always promise, I, I've told very loose variations on this because I will always honor this person's uh, desire to be anonymous. Oh, sure. But um, they came with a friend to a conference I was speaking at in a state that I have, it was in, and afterwards came up to me, as people do, <clears throat> and, you know, people say, good talk, or I have a question for you. The people who interest me most are the ones who hang at the edges waiting for other people to go. Some of them are experiencers. Some of them feel they've had abduction experiences. Some of them are just incredible weird balls that try to get you into a corner and tell you everything <laughs> about everything that you got wrong and that you should know. Um, and she said, you know, when you showed that picture, I remembered, oh, yeah, we used to walk there and this one here, there. Her husband was a sergeant who was stationed at Rendlesham and um, ended up, after he left the service, um, having severe problems and his life ended early and shortly after she received a 9 by 12 envelope uh, addressed to her you know brown paper with a simple printed address the White House Washington DC she's telling me this uh, she seems credible um, but and um, it was a certificate from the President of the United States uh, with condolences on the loss of her loved one and mm -hmm. his great service to the country. And she told me about what he did in the service, and it was it seemed to be fairly low level. And in time, <clears throat> she allowed me to see this certificate and his service record. And it just made my jaw drop. Nothing about it made sense. She also said she was receiving more money for something that she was not entitled to every month from, you know, the Pentagon. And boy, did I want to include that in the book. And of course, wasn't able to. But I think the surprising thing about UFO conferences is overall, 
the incredibly um, regular folks that are there. You meet a very modest percentage of real weird balls hmm. or people who, you know, seem delusional or just lonely souls who want something to believe in. And that's increasing, including the one um, last week in Portland, Oregon that I spoke at. Most of the folks that were there were local people from Portland who just wanted to know more about the subject. And it would have been a wonderful first conference for anybody to go to. It was one terrific talk after another. But yeah, um, the fact is very little weird stuff actually hmm. happens at UFO <laughs> conferences, <laughs> certainly to me, you know. Well, I think that's good. I don't yeah, know. Sometimes I, I, the weird stuff I'm makes it more it. interesting. Mm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I thank you for coming up, Peter. We'll have you My up pleasure. on Where the Road Go again uh, probably before the end of the year, I would hope. Works for me. All right. And uh, we're going to continue with a few more UFO-inspired songs. This one from Voivod. This is We Are Not Alone.